Hello, and thank you for tuning in to our channel. Before we dive in, we need a small favor from you, please take a moment to hit the subscribe, thumbs up, and notification buttons below, so you can stay updated on all our latest videos. Speaking of the United States Navy after the Cold War, it can be said to be an invincible presence on the Blue Planet, so it began to think outside the box. In terms of shipbuilding concepts, it shifted from offshore attack to sea migration. Driven by this ideology, we have seen the current DDG-1000 and littoral combat ships in the U.S. Navy. However, with the rise of a certain major country's navy, the combat power of the U.S. Navy in the Pacific has truly plummeted, leading to insufficient regular combat power. The planned construction of the littoral combat ships in DDG-1000 faced unsolvable problems such as high construction costs, low combat effectiveness, and very cumbersome modular design replacements. As a result, the number of constructions had to be reduced, and some were even retired. In recent years, under the financial constraints faced by the U.S. Navy, the procurement quantity has still been maintained at 20 ships. It has not decreased, but the construction speed in the first two years has been reduced from two ships per year to one ship per year. By the fiscal year 2032, the entire plan will be completed. The progress of the entire project can be considered extremely rapid for the United States Navy after the Cold War. What exactly are its outstanding features? What makes the United States Navy still look at it with such admiration even when tightening their belts? Today, let's follow my model and take a look at the 7,000-ton class super frigate, the FFJX Constellation class. All right, now I have opened my model, and actually, the U.S. Department of Defense announced that they started planning and designing this in 2017. Among them, five shipyards bid for the future frigate of the United States. In the end, it was the Marinette shipyard under the Italian Fincantieri Group that won the bid, and Fincantieri was responsible for the design. You may not have heard of Italy's Fincantieri, but it is actually very famous. Yes, the famous Franco-Italian joint European frigate was designed by this shipyard and built in Italy. Now, let's talk about the Constellation class again. As we mentioned earlier, why does the United States still insist on building this ship despite being so troubled by funding issues? The main reason is, well, the Zumwalt-class destroyer, which was born at an inopportune time. Only three of these DDG-1000 ships were built due to their high cost. This includes the Littoral Combat Ship, which was originally planned to have more than 50 ships but was cut down to 35. Additionally, the Arleigh Burke-class Flight 3 destroyers we discussed in the previous session were reduced from 12 ships to 7. This also includes one Virginia-class nuclear submarine and the early retirement of the Ticonderoga-class cruisers. Moreover, for littoral combat ships are also set to be retired early. The Pentagon even called for the U.S. military to quickly reduce two aircraft carriers, as the financial strain has become unbearable. In this situation, the construction of the future Constellation-class frigate still has its considerations. The first is the urgent need, because the rapid development of a certain major country's navy has made the U.S. feel that the ships planned in the past 20 years have become negative examples. Although their appearance is very sci-fi and they are packed with technology, their sea-to-land combat capabilities cannot adapt to the high-intensity future ocean battles. Therefore, they are very unsuitable for regular naval warfare. Moreover, the so-called aircraft carrier battle groups of the U.S. in the past have been reduced to aircraft carrier strike groups. A strike group actually consists of one aircraft carrier, one Ticonderoga-class cruiser, and at most two Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, which is a very minimal configuration. However, what about the Ticonderoga-class cruisers? Although they are command ships, their capabilities are quite average, and they are very old, so most of the important tasks such as air defense and anti-submarine warfare are undertaken by the Arleigh Burke-class destroyers. Additionally, the Arleigh Burke-class destroyers also have to perform daily tasks such as reconnaissance, alert patrols, escort missions, and even verification and expulsion tasks. Therefore, this affects the service life of their hulls. 
Another point is that the Arleigh Burke class destroyers are powered by four gas turbines, which consume a lot of fuel, making them expensive for the U.S. to operate. Previously, these tasks were handled by the Perry class frigates, right? But the Perry class frigates have now mostly been retired, so the U.S. has no choice but to use the Arleigh Burke class destroyers to fill in. However, their construction costs are too high, so the U.S. decided to develop a general purpose frigate to handle lower intensity tasks. Therefore, they entrusted the design of this frigate to the Italians. So, let's first compare the previous conditions of Italy. Everyone, take a look. Hmm, we won't talk about the conditions of the farmer today, but the Italian version of this. Its ship type is almost the same. Well, I must say that the design by the Italians is very beautiful. Although it is a frigate, its total displacement is close to 7,000 tons. Now, let's look at the Constellation class. First, let's talk about its basic combat requirements after returning to tradition, such as escorting, including accompanying aircraft carriers. Performing some anti-submarine tasks, expelling and destroying enemy ships, etc. When you look at this design, you can see that it abandons those sci-fi appearances and unrealistic elements and returns to tradition. First, let's introduce its weapon configuration. Let's look at the front deck first. On the front deck, a 57 million Malawi and Quacha's 1110 naval gun is installed, capable of firing programmable ammunition. Its rate of fire is very high. This naval gun is also installed on the littoral combat ship, but its caliber might be slightly smaller compared to the Italian OTO Malara gun, right? Although it is a 57mm gun, its rate of fire is still quite impressive, which enhances its air defense capabilities. Behind it, a 32 cell 41 Malawi and Quacha's vertical launch system is installed. This is a standard configuration for the U.S. Navy. Previously, when discussing the Arleigh Burke class destroyers, the 41 Malawi and Quacha's vertical launch system did not have a very detailed model, so a French or European vertical launcher was temporarily used as a substitute. Now, the model has been perfected, and I can show it to everyone. All right, let me display the missile. Take it out, and everyone can clearly see that this missile has also been redone. On the far left is the ASROC anti-submarine rocket-assisted torpedo. In the middle, this is the quad-packed Sea Sparrow missile. You can see the Sea Sparrow missile, and the one on the far left with a booster is the standard Missile 6, SM-6, air defense missile. The SM-6 air defense missile is designed to work with its Aegis combat system, which we will discuss later. Previously, its design included plans to install some directed energy weapons and so on. However, these initial conditions definitely do not include such installations. Previously, there was an experiment on the Arleigh Burke class destroyer with a 150 kilowatt directed energy weapon. Directed energy weapons or the 60 kilowatt SNLWS laser weapon planned to be tested on the Burke class destroyer this year are all possible installations but they are to be installed in future scenarios. So, looking at its missile configuration, you can see that its main tasks are anti-submarine and air defense. Next, let's briefly explain its radar configuration. First, it has the SPY 6V3 Active Electronically Scanned Array ASA, radar, which is a three-faced shield. Although its detection range is not as good as that of the Burke-class destroyers, it is still quite considerable. Raytheon has developed several versions of the SPY-6 radar, and this version is almost the same as the one installed on the Ford-class aircraft carriers. Additionally, unlike the previous design, the new shipyard renderings show that it is equipped with X-band radars, and there seem to be two of them on the mast. These also include two FX-band radars, which are likely four-faced arrays exposed on the outside. The traditional mast design of the Burke-class destroyers has been retained and has not been replaced with an integrated mast, possibly to save costs. However, the cost of its three-faced Aegis radar system is still very high. In the middle, there is something that looks like a dog bowl. What is this? 
In fact, it is a navigation radar with an antenna cover on the outside, but it is still a navigation radar inside. Whether it will be replaced with a more advanced radar in the future is currently unknown. Under the mast, there is the 20 Malawian Quacha's electro-optical sensor, which is something you often see on the Burke class destroyers, so we won't elaborate much on it. Next, let's look at its electronic warfare system. On the sides, there are two SLQ-32V passive electronic warfare systems. The active system is the 53 Malawian Quacha's active decoy launching system located in these four places at the back. Then, looking further up the mast, there is a large cluster of equipment. This cluster includes many things, such as the FF, another system, data link, friend or foe identification, and cooperative engagement capability systems. It is quite similar to the Burke class destroyers. Now, let's mainly talk about the SPY 6V3 radar, which should be integrated with the latest Aegis system, including Baseline 10. The detection range should reach 800 to 1000 kilometers, although its frontal area is somewhat smaller. According to this standard, the air defense range of the SM6 is about 200 to 260 kilometers, so it can completely intercept some sea-skimming supersonic anti-ship missiles. However, it does not have missile defense capabilities, for that, you need the SM3. The SPY-6 radar on the Burke-class destroyers has a longer range. This radar is said to be able to detect objects up to 2,500 kilometers away, although this is in a staring mode, which is still very impressive. Moving on, the Constellation class has not only increased the number of vertical launch systems from the original 16 to 32 but also installed the Norwegian Kongsberg NSM stealth anti-ship missiles. Although the NSM is a subsonic anti-ship missile, its stealth performance is quite good. The strike effectiveness of this missile is better than the old Harpoon anti-ship missile used by the US for many years, at least in terms of stealth and anti-jamming capabilities. Additionally, it unprecedentedly installed 16 missiles, greatly enhancing the US Navy's insufficient anti-ship missile capabilities. In the future, it may also install the shipborne version of the LRASM in an 8-cell configuration, which is four boxes of 8-cell stealth long-range anti-ship missiles. It might even install hypersonic anti-ship missiles, which is also a possibility. Therefore, the Constellation class is positioned as a relatively comprehensive warship. Over here is a small boat compartment, and under the anti-ship missiles, there might be lightweight anti-submarine torpedoes. The hangar is a single hangar, but it is a wide one. It can accommodate one MH-60S Seahawk anti-submarine helicopter, including one MQ-8C Fire Scout unmanned helicopter as a complement. On top of the hangar, there is a 21-cell CRAM close-in air defense missile system. Of course, there are also some machine gun mounts and other equipment. All right, having finished discussing the weapon configuration, you can see that it is a standard frigate weapon configuration. However, its weapon configuration has already greatly surpassed many European ships, second only to the level of the Burke-class destroyers, especially in terms of anti-ship missiles, which are even stronger than those of the Burke-class. Having finished discussing the weapons, let's introduce its propulsion and some basic parameters. This ship can be said to be an unprecedented large frigate built by the U.S. Navy. In terms of the frigate class, its displacement has already reached over 6,000 tons, and its full load displacement can reach 7,200 tons. The ship's length is 151.2 meters, and its beam is close to 20 meters, about 19.8 meters. The full load displacement is over 7,200 tons. The propulsion system adopts a combined diesel and gas, CODAG, system, and it is a globally pioneering system developed by an Italian company for the Frem frigate. At the front, there are two exhaust outlets for the diesel engines. On either side of the small boat compartment at the shoulder of the ship, there is an LM2500 gas turbine, and next to it are two exhaust outlets for the gas and diesel engines. Although it uses a combined diesel and gas propulsion system, it is also equipped with an electric motor for propulsion. In cruising mode, 
It uses four diesel engines to generate electricity and operates in a semi-electric propulsion mode. This greatly reduces the noise of the ship, especially during anti-submarine operations. For high-speed cruising, such as when accompanying an aircraft carrier strike group, the gas turbine is activated. The gas turbine is likely coaxial with the electric motor, allowing it to drive the propeller. It operates at high speed and then works in conjunction with the four diesel engines to generate electricity. In this way, it uses electric propulsion during economic cruising and anti-submarine cruising, and it uses the gas turbine during high-speed operations accompanying aircraft carrier battle groups. Therefore, its propulsion system is very advanced and is worth learning from for many countries. This is a significant advantage. Another advantage is its high tonnage, which allows for future upgrades and modifications to its weapon systems. This includes the potential addition of directed energy weapons, which are not yet installed. For example, drones and unmanned underwater vehicles can be added to the stern, similar to the Japanese Kumano class. In our previous video, we introduced the Kumano class warship, which carries many underwater unmanned vehicles, including minesweeping equipment. Moreover, although this ship does not have a bulbous bow, it is equipped with a hull-mounted sonar, including two types of totaray sonar and variable depth sonar. In the future, it can also be equipped with unmanned underwater vehicles, and its tonnage reaches over 7,000 tons, which is comparable to our latest 052D1 destroyer. Therefore, although it is a frigate, its displacement has reached that of a destroyer. In terms of firepower and tonnage, the only comparable ship in the future would be our 054B. The 054B, as I mentioned in a previous session, might be slightly smaller than the Constellation class, but its radar, anti-ship, and anti-submarine capabilities are almost the same. So, from the design concept of the Constellation class, we can see. It can also be seen that the United States has made some adjustments to its previous sea-to-land policy, reaching a more pragmatic level. It is said that many retired ship captains and naval officers have become consultants at American shipyards, leading to the elimination of impractical elements from the literal combat ship program. These impractical elements were considered negative examples and were all cut out, leading to a more pragmatic approach. This pragmatic approach resulted in the development of the new generation of U.S. frigates. This new frigate is quite powerful, but its cost is also astonishing. As of the 2023 fiscal year, only one ship can be built, and many components, such as radars and other systems, are included. The data link and other systems still need to be gradually improved, and it may take about 10 years to build all the Plan 20 ships. During these 10 years, what changes will the Navy of a certain major eastern country undergo? Let's wait and see. Alright, the above is a brief introduction to the Constellation class frigate and I hope everyone can have a comprehensive understanding of this ship. Alright, the above is a basic introduction to the US Constellation class, and I hope everyone can have a relatively comprehensive understanding of this type of ship. As a 7,000-ton class frigate, who will be its future opponent? Here, we must mention the next-generation new frigate of a certain major country, the 054B. To talk about the 054B, we must first mention its predecessor, the 054A. The Type 054A frigate is considered a relatively successful frigate worldwide, and it has been exported to our Pakistani brothers. The success of the 054A mainly lies in its positioning as a duty ship in our Navy, because it uses a diesel engine propulsion system, allowing it to be ready for deployment at any time with a quick response. Additionally, its multi-purpose capabilities, including air defense, anti-submarine, anti-ship, and escort missions, are all well handled, and it is economical. Having understood the advantages of the 054A, we can roughly determine some technical parameters of the 054B. It should amplify the advantages of the 054A, enhancing its air defense, anti-submarine, and anti-ship capabilities, and adopt a new integrated electric propulsion management system. In the future, it will accompany aircraft carriers for long-range escort missions, positioning it as a large ocean-going frigate. 
It also needs to adapt to new forms of future battlefields, with drones and unmanned boats being deployed on the ship. Finally, I would like to end this video with a quote from the Heaven Sword and Dragon Saber, the Constellation Sword commands obedience, and without young heroes, who can compete? Alright, thank you all for watching my channel. If you liked it, please click subscribe and support with likes and shares. See you next time, bye bye.